<laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Dan with Blurb, and we are uh, broadcasting today from deep inside Blurb Command Center here in San Francisco. Uh, I work as photographer at large for Blurb, and also in the room today we have a full house. We have Jake to my left who's answering questions, which uh, brings me to my first point here, which is if you have questions during the webinar, make sure that you fire them in in the little chat section, and we will try to get to as many as we can at the end. So we've also got Christina in here today. She's working the, uh, the switchboard. She's got a very fancy headset on. It looks very professional. We've got Alistair behind the cameras here because we're super high tech and have a two camera setup. And we've also got Lori who's also going to be taking questions. So when you fire them in, she's going to feed those to us a little bit later. We have a very special guest today, Bob Offeldish, who is a local San Francisco book designer. But he is also an educator. And I'm going to throw in a third title because I've seen your books. He's also a okay. photographer. He's made some yep. books with us that are, that are beautiful. You and I have a little bit of a history here. Mm -hmm. Back in the day when Blurb was doing their annual uh, Photography Book Now contest, you were one of the right. judges, which is yeah. where we first met. Yep. And then subsequently, we actually, you and I went on a world tour with Jerry Crevassier. It was a yeah. three-man band mm -hmm. with no music involved, luckily. And we did New York and London and Chicago and San Francisco, and we did right. a book publishing thing. And you gave a presentation. My point of this long rambling story is you gave a presentation that I sat through, I think, seven times because it was one of the best presentations I've ever seen. And it was primarily about design and typography. And right. it really proved to me how little I knew. So it made me <laughs> feel horrible, but the crowd really loved it. So thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for asking. What, uh, what have you been up to lately? Uh, let's see, I was on sabbatical from teaching f at the California College of the Arts uh, last year, so this fall semester was my first semester back. Okay. Fantastic to be back, but also you forget how much work that is. Oh, yeah. Showing up and uh, having your brain turned on high for three hour stretches, little break, brain on high, yeah. three more hours. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah. And but so, it's super exciting. How long have you been in design? Or been a designer, I should say. I don't know, thirty-five years. That's something it. Like just that. thirty-five years. Yeah. Just doubt. So it's a hobby, really. Graphic design is the perfect hobby, actually. And you've also you have uh, your, one of your specialties is typography, mm -hmm. and you've been teaching typography. And this was one of the things when I first met you, and you told me how long you've been doing this. How long have you been teaching typography? Twenty years. God, that's just remarkable. Well, today, hopefully. Uh, we are going to pick your brain as much as humanly possible because right. what you have inside of your brain is exactly what every Blurb user in the world needs, including myself, which is design help, illustration help, and typography. So the All webinar right. today is called How to Design Not Just a Regular Magazine, but the Ultimate Magazine. Mm. So let's get started here. Okay. Uh, Christina, are we on my screen or are we on us? We can, uh, well, we'll just, I'll just move along. <laughs> So my first question is, why magazine? And I have, because you make a lot of books, I make a lot of books, we also have this ability to make magazines. W right. What are some of the reasons why someone would make a magazine over making a book? And I've got three or four things here I can ping in on, but wh what do you think? I think the thing about a magazine is that the kind of content you put into it is slightly different than the kind of content you might put into a book. Okay. So a book generally speaking, is going to be sort of a focused, single topic thing. Whereas a magazine has the opportunity to be sort of a more curated, general viewpoint kind of idea that a bunch of different kinds of things that can plug into, whether it's a photo essay or a series of illustrations or a short story or what have you. Okay. And there's some kind of overall creative vision behind the magazine that allows it to have multiple iterations. I think that's the great opportunity there. And I think what you're speaking to speaks to one of the points I had, which is I think a magazine is a great way to collaborate. Yeah. And I think it's one of the things, I've seen some really wonderful collaborations come through Blurb, and there's people out there, there's photo organizations that use us for sort of an mm -hmm. annual publication. Right. But I think magazines are great for coming up with that, that theme and then branching out to different artists around the world to collaborate. I, I'd love to actually see a lot more people doing that at Blurb. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first point that I had was about installment publishing, and this has become mm -hmm. a really hot topic again. Yeah. Uh, Dickens did installment publishing, and Tom Wolfe did Bonfire of the Vanities, and a lot of really famous authors have done that, and you've seen a mm -hmm. comeback, and even places like Amazon are now trying to figure out how installment publishing fits in, and I think magazines are good 
for that as well because it, it, it allows you to put out a little taste of something that leaves mm -hmm. people wanting a bit more. Right, yeah. Uh, I also think that they're affordable. I'm not sure, have you even made, have you made a Blurb magazine or no, just the books? Just the books. They're, well, being a Blurb person, I can tell you that uh, very, they're very <laughs> cost effective. And uh, No excuse not to do one. The other thing that I think is great is that a magazine signifies typically that there is another issue on the way, mm -hmm. and I think that they're consumed a little differently. They're in some good way, they're informal. Right, you'll, right. you'll take it to a pool, you'll read it somewhere, and maybe yeah. toss it because you know that there's another issue on the way, which mm -hmm. is very unlike a book. You probably mm -hmm. wouldn't. I wouldn't take your 12 by 12 hardcover book on vacation to the pool and then throw it away. One, Thank I know you. you, and two, that'd be pretty rude. So you know. <laughs> but I also think one of the things about making a magazine is you don't have to think about it as this is going to come out in a series of installments. It could be a one-off. Yeah. I mean, it's just a form that you can play with. And so maybe you have this giant editorial vision that's going to play out over the course of a year or two, but maybe you have just one idea and you want to like see where it goes. And then, uh, then you can evaluate whether or not there needs to be more than one of these things. Would you ever make an issue of a magazine as a test piece or a sample and play? We were talking earlier uh -huh. about sometimes people put this a tremendous amount of pressure on themselves yeah. <clears throat> to build something monumental when in essence they should just build something. Yeah, the best way to, to do any of this kind of stuff is to make something, possibly screw it up, and then make it again. Failure. Yeah, failing forward. So let me ask you, you've made, you've made several publications with Blurb. Mm -hmm. Were those publications, did you, and you are a designer, so you've got an inside angle here on actually making mm -hmm. something that's right, right out of the gate. Did you make books or magazines and then tweak them and make a subsequent version? Almost always. Okay. Yeah. Now that's not something that you can do in your, in your professional world in terms of working with a, <laughs> on offset print run. It's no. got to be right. No, it has to be right. Yeah, but one of the things about the things I make for myself is they're for me. So there's not the give and take with a, with a client or a, an editorial board or a curator or what have you. That's sort of focusing the thing in until yeah. it's fulfilling all the requirements that it needs to fulfill. When I'm working for myself, it's like, well, I think I have this figured out. Okay. So let's run it. And the beauty of Blurb is that you can just do one, comes to the house, you live with it for a while, and then you decide what it needs or what's missing or whether it should ever even see the light of day. Yes, and uh, I've made <laughs> 200 plus publications and a, a lot of, you know, that's a number that freaks people out and mm -hmm. rightly so, that's a lot of publications, but there's only, I think, a half a dozen that are publicly available if you went onto my Blurb author page right. and said, hey, you know, yeah. this is the books that you have. And mm -hmm. even some of those are not books that I would ever like push and say this is something I'm really trying to promote. Mm -hmm. But I've made, every single book that I've made or magazine that I've made has come back and I've thought, oh, this, I did this really well and I need to do this better. Mm -hmm. And it's been this sort of, it's taken me a long time and I don't have a design background, so I don't have the mm -hmm. same, same things. I make, probably make a lot more mistakes. So. A lot of the magazines that I make are what I would call run-on sentences. They're just long, because I'm primarily a photographer, so this, right. is, this is an issue, an episode that's about one particular person. Let's talk a little bit about standard design elements that you mm. might find in a magazine mm -hmm. and whether or not these are things that are absolutely essential to being in there or you can do whatever the heck you want. So things like a running head or a kicker, subheads, pull quotes, things like that, are these things that you think are essential? It's only essential if it's important for whatever story or vision that you have. I think, you know, people get re can get really hung up on like what stuff is supposed to do or supposed to be. And I think the quicker you get rid of all of that and just move on to what your vision is, the better off you're going to be. So let me ask you something about title and logo as a standard design element. That has to be critical mm -hmm. because the logo, that's your, really your brand. So like I was telling sense, you, uh, yeah earlier that I just recently uh, watched the documentary about Hunter Thompson and they were showing early editions of Rolling Stone mm -hmm. and it had the red banner around the outside of the cover and it was that that amazing Rolling Stone font and that just immediately cements itself in your brain when you see that so even if you don't have all of the standard design elements of a magazine the cover and the logo that design's got to be crucial yeah. yeah absolutely and you want you want that to add up in a way that kind of signifies what your attitude and vision is for the thing. 
you know, Rolling Stone has changed their, their masthead uh, four or five times. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you look at the early issues, that type is completely different from what it is now. Sure. And, um, but they've been publishing for how long? A long time. Yeah. But nonetheless, um, so as the vision changes, that logo changes as well. Um, I think at the beginning you can start perhaps with a, a typeface that has a certain amount of character and if it gets big enough you, you uh, job out to somebody to have it customized in some way. I mean the more personality it has and the more accurate that personality is mm -hmm. to what you're doing and what your vision is about, the better the thing is going to be. You want someone to look at it and immediately have a feel for what this thing is about in a truthful kind of way. Sure. Right? You want it to be you want it to be accurate to what you're, what you're presenting to people. Now, on the flip side of that, you had Raygun Magazine, which changed their, their logo, their masthead, their cover, every single issue. Mm -hmm. So as, a, as an independent publisher, you have this ability to do whatever the heck you want. But I think um, what right. you said is absolutely yeah. right. And, and you, know, you can play on that Raygun thing of, of making mm -hmm. changes. But I think the cohesiveness of that cover, because then it begins to signify the content of what's, what's mm -hmm. inside. It signifies... Is there any suggestions that you would have for uh, how you would design a cover like that, whether it's a certain type of typography or mm -hmm. things that you would do or wouldn't do or stay away from? Well, I think one of the advantages of working for yourself is you don't have all the commercial pressures that regular magazines have. So if you look at a, a magazine on the newsstand, there'll be the masthead, there'll be like some famous person's face, <laughs> there'll be... There'll be some kind of big type about the, the thing about that famous person, and then there'll be just a boatload of other stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, they're desperately hoping that you're going to scan that thing and say, oh, there's a thing about Radiohead. All right, fine, I'll buy this. Yeah. Um, if you're doing your own magazine, you don't need any of that, right? You just have, I think, the cleaner, more concise graphically powerful statement you can make visually, yeah. the better off it's going to work. So whether it's teeny tiny type and a super graphic image or enormous type and a smaller image, whatever that is, right. uh, it just needs to have that kind of visual punch. That's good. That's uh, like this brilliant cover here. Is that what you're... That, that's on, well, I was looking top. at this the whole time I was talking. Exactly. For that's a good why, reason. You know, that's, yeah. that's, that's good. So we're going to move on here a little bit to the next topic, which is, I actually, as you can see on my screen here, <laughs> it says Bob's Wheelhouse. We are going to talk a little bit about typography. And okay. just to, another little side story about this. When you and I went on our world tour, right. we were walking down the street in London, and there was a restaurant that I want to say was a chicken restaurant of some sort, and they had their sign out in front, and you said something along the lines of, it had the name of the restaurant in the year that they were open, and the type that they had used on their sign, you said that doesn't make any sense because that font came out in such and such a year and that restaurant opened in another year. And that's to me when I thought, wow, there are people out there that, that know <laughs> typography. Are sick. Yes, they have, they, they have a sickness <laughs> in regard to typography. What is it about typography that, that put the hooks in you all those years ago? Why was it so important? I mean, on the most mundane level, it's because I couldn't draw well enough to make my own imagery. So what's left if you're a designer is, is the typography, right? You yeah. can make imagery, you can, you can generate a certain voice about your work using just type. And uh, when I was in school, you know, the hot new high-tech invention was a Xerox machine. Oof, you're yeah. dating, just yep. a little bit of dating yourself. Ah, show the cover. We just got a note, show the cover. Show the cover. We've got a lot is of that covers long here enough? Wait, look at. I see. It's brilliant. That's my there magazine, by the way. Uh, which it's was centered. My fingers are blocking too much of it. All it's right. It's brilliant. We're good. Uh, and just as a quick side story before we go back, <laughs> this was done as a test, as a sample of our new 8x10 trade format, which I right. thought would actually make a nice magazine. As you can see, it's slightly smaller than our 85 by 11 magazine. Mm -hmm. They both work well. Yep. Okay, back to typography. So anyway, just working with type became a, a way of me... Uh, for me to make my own voice okay. visually. So, uh, you know, with that hot Xerox machine technology, sure. you could enlarge stuff out of old books and combine it together and then Xerox the result. And okay. It was a blast. I would 
the vast majority of people who are going to be watching this webinar today are not, not going to have Xerox machines. They're not going to have Xerox <laughs> machines, which is very sad. But they're also not going to have your background in typography. So right. a couple of things, of basic things that are helpful to people when it comes to, let's, let's keep with magazine. Mm -hmm. Let's say that you're designing the cover and the inside of this magazine. How many different fonts would you choose for an entire issue? Mm -hmm. How many fonts would you choose for a cover, like the, mm -hmm. the title and the sub subtitles? Right. And what are some pitfalls that can really burn you with, with typography? That was a Ooh, lot of questions. Oh, man. This is a tricky one. Well, I think when I design stuff like this, I start with the text typeface. So what is the type that the, the reader is going to spend the most time with? The body. The, the body, body copy. copy. OK. Right? And the fundamental choice there is, is it going to have serifs or is it not? So serif or sans serif? And that's the fundamental question. Yes. It's like, you know. That's where all the design jokes come from. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> exactly. We're not going to go there. So, you know, um, and then you want to have a sense of like how big do you want it to be, right? The bigger the type gets, the more you have a sense of like what what is the character of the type. Right. So if you if you're going to have a lot of text and you know the text needs to be small, then that's not as important, right? You just want something that'll read well at that size. Right. If it's going to be bigger and the quality of the type and its personality are going to be uh, more evident, then you need to pay attention to that a little bit more. But that's the fundamental question, serif or sans serif. And there's serif. no right and wrong. No right answer. Although no. if you took rodeo font, let's say, and used that as body copy, that conceivably is a problem because it's a, you can't read it. Right. But and for those of you, that's a typeface that is made out of like, apparently made out of rope. Like a lasso. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Which yeah, is, you probably don't want to read that for an extended period of time. Exactly. Uh, one of the things that I see a lot of times, <laughs> publications that come through Blurb, too many different kinds of typefaces in the mm -hmm. same document, mm -hmm. or uh, type that's too large. And, and I found, even when I look back on the first books that I made, and even this magazine, uh, some of the copy that's in there, it's too large for me. I'm always, right. I'm always finding myself erring on the, on the small side. So here's the trick for that. The reason that happens is because people are designing on screen. Yes. So, and this is hard for me to even get my students to do, but just print some pages out ahead of time and look at them. That's great advice. It's the simplest thing in the world. And even after doing this for as many years as I have, I am always printing out and looking at what I'm doing. Like, and sometimes the slightest little changes of either size or spatial relationships can make a huge difference in how the thing feels and how you visually navigate through the information. And let's go back to the cover. Uh -huh. How many, let's talk quantity, of different kinds of fonts. Like for me personally, I would look at a cover and say I probably wouldn't use any more than two mm -hmm. typefaces on the cover. What do you think? Yeah, I wouldn't use too many. Unless your whole idea is that the thing has a kind of visual energy that you need all of those typefaces to so somehow communicate. Then use as many as you possibly can. Change every letter if you need to. You are a risk taker. That's like an 80s, that's a very 80s thing. I mean, in the 80s, we had that type explosion where you had right. books. Yeah. Uh, Albert Watson's Cyclops is one that comes to mind in the mm -hmm. photo world where you swirls of fonts and typography. It was right. beautiful, but it, it seems a sh very short-lived kind of thing. I think that book is a classic now, actually. It is. There I, that, was a time a where everyone book. was like, that is just crazy. And then there was a time where people were like, that was hideous. You were an idiot for, for doing that book. And now, classic. It's OK. Are yeah. there any sort of, let's say, going back to the, the term wheelhouse here, are there any <laughs> wheelhouse fonts that you find yourself using on a, on a repeated basis? And, and for example, when I design a book in Blurb, or anyone does, you have the drop down menu of all the fonts. And I go through there. And a lot of times, I'm always like, oh, I don't want to use these because they're too common. Mm -hmm. And yet, I talk to designers that have like a love affair with Helvetica, or they have a love affair with one of these very typical fonts. Is there anything in your wheelhouse that you would say to people, this is, this is a safe zone in terms of typography? Well, I mean, sure, Helvetica. I mean, because it sort of disappears. Right? It's so ubiquitous, it's almost invisible. So if that's what you want, mm -hmm. then that's the perfect choice for that kind of thing. Um, but what I'm always looking for is typefaces that are perhaps Helvetica-like without mm -hmm. actually being Helvetica, because it makes a slightly different visual texture. So when you look at it, 
it's familiar but also different at the same time. And the okay. typeface that I've been using a lot for a number of years is called National. It's available from the Village Type Foundry. It's not cheap, but it comes with an enormous number of variations from super, super thin to really, really kind of chunky and bold. And so the when you invest in a type family yes. like that, you, what you're getting is the ability to to use a typeface that has an, an enormous array of visual voices. Okay. And what that allows you to do is sort of fine tune everything, right? There's there's cheap, you know, five or ten dollar typefaces, but you get only one, and maybe some characters are missing. And if there's something slightly off about that, you have no recourse. It's either that or nothing. Now you mentioned where you got that type factory. Village. Village. And are there other places that you go to on a regular basis yeah. to find typography? Yeah, the most popular place for licensing fonts these days is MyFonts. MyFonts. Okay. Um, so I'm always looking at that, but I'm also on the mailing list for You Work for Them. Okay. Which is great because they will send an email every once in a while saying there's a certain new typeface, it's just been released, and we have this like special offer. Buy it today for fifteen dollars. And after today, the price goes up to two hundred and fifty dollars. Wow. So for someone like me, that's like crack. That's Christmas every day. It's Christmas, yeah. you know, once every other week or so. So I'll instantly go. I imagine their click through rate is just insane, right? I'll immediately go and look at the typeface and wonder, is there anything I can possibly imagine using this for? Because for $15, yeah. I've got it. That's a good investment. It's a good investment. And it's a way to like build up uh, a palette of typefaces that are maybe a little bit more unusual for not so much money. I think the term that you used is, is a very important one, which was in, when, you, when you invest and in essence, what you're saying is when you invest in your, yourself as a designer, mm -hmm. you're, you're giving yourself the best tools that you can. Right. Is there, any, is there any way for me to ask, is there a typeface that would be very magazine specific? Or is it just too wide ranging? Like historically, I didn't know if there was a, mag a typical like body copy font that people mm. had used historically mm. for magazines. I mean, there, in the early 20th century, there was a whole kind of trend of magazines having their own typefaces designed and because those are so old now they've been re-released and you can get them so there's like the century family which designed for century magazine which has been gone forever but it's actually very common for contemporary magazines to have a whole suite of typefaces designed specifically, specifically for, them. for them and um, oftentimes the type foundry will have some kind of deal with the magazine where the magazine gets it exclusively for a certain amount of time, and then it becomes a commercial release. Okay. So probably the, the typeface that comes to mind immediately for me that is in that category is a typeface called Archer. Okay, sure. Which was made for Martha Stewart a number of years ago. Martha Stewart has moved on, and now it's commercially available from uh, Hoffler Type Foundry. I've got a tricky question now. Still in, still in the wheelhouse, still, still in typography. In All right, tee it up. Yesterday I designed 66 page book slash ebook with the primary destination being the digital copy. Uh -huh. I have to design that with a, di with a digital book type friendly font. Mm -hmm. How has that changed and are there any digital friendly fonts that you cling to? I don't do so much of that kind of work, so I don't really have a super it's big. Because you're anti-technology. <laughs> Clearly, that's what it right, is. Right, because I'm sitting in a room like surrounded by people with <laughs> laptops. <laughs> so you don't do a lot of digital d design. No, I mean I think almost everything nowadays has been rehinted, so you can embed it, and it's not really that big a deal. I think the time when that was a big problem has pretty much passed. passed. Yeah. yeah, I I I don't see that as a big issue anymore. I mean, generally speaking, you want something with a large X height, which means the, the little lowercase letters are larger and more round okay. than they might be ordinarily. But otherwise... Well, I think one of the things, I, misconceptions, is that people do not have to design to the same level with a digital product as they do with a print product. And I think mm -hmm. it's the exact opposite of mm -hmm. that, because you're designing in many cases for these thumbnails that you're viewing on a, on a right. mobile device or a, yeah. or a Kindle. I think the design has to be 
has to be very good, and I mm -hmm. think very clean and simple, right. talking about what you referred to earlier, and yeah. I think the typography of something like a title has to be even perhaps simpler and bolder because you're only getting such a fleeting moment. It's not right. like going to Barnes & Noble where you're perusing and being able to physically handle something. Yeah, yeah it's got to be super graphic. And then the other ish big issue for electronic publishing is the navigation, right? Because with the book or with a magazine, the navigation is it's clear, it's familiar, and it's analog. So we can access it in a number of ways and it's very intuitive and easy. With digital things, that's not always the case. Right. And so what you don't want to do is make the navigation overly complicated somehow. Yeah, that's, uh, it's simple. I think I, when eBooks first came out, you saw this tremendous complexity. And then I think people realized right. that the attention span's not really there for mm -hmm. that. And people just want to be able to consume simply like a physical thing. Right. OK, moving on. I know it's, it's sad we're departing a little bit from typography, although we can, we can come back. And I'm, I'm sure there'll be questions at the end about typography. Magazines require, in some cases, very specific pieces of content, and one of those that I wanted to touch on is table of contents. Mm -hmm. I have personally never made a table of contents because, again, the magazines that I'm making are, I jokingly refer to them as a run-on sentence. It's just the same basic right. theme all the way through 80 yeah. or 100 pages. Mm -hmm. what, what's the, any suggestions on making a good table of contents? Well, the I think you bring up a good point, which is, do you even need one? Yes. So you only need one if you want to help people find what's in your magazine. And I can see plenty of reasons why you may not want to be that helpful, <laughs> right? You might want them to like have to slog their way through this thing, right? Because you have a certain kind of idea. But that wasn't your question. But that's a good point. I want to come back to that when you're done. OK. So I think a table of contents is. Uh, you have to figure out what is what are the stories or sections that you want to highlight, yep. right? So those need to come forward. So that means either bolder or bigger or more to the top of the page. You need to uh, link the page number to that uh, right. information in some kind of clear and simple way. And you have to decide, do I really need to have every last little thing that's in here in the table of contents? Right? So maybe you have a section that's got a bunch of little things in it, and so all you relate to in the table of contents is that section, but not everything that's in that section. Okay. So it's a matter of uh, deciding what's, what's important, what do you really want to say, and then how do you get people to that spot. Would you use the same type that you would use for body copy or for your subtitles and heading? Would you have a specific font for the table of contents? I would try to have everything relate. Everything. So the same use of the same typography. Yeah. You're going one type, one font the entire publication. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but let's say that you have, would it be the same, the same font that you used for the title of the magazine or for the subtitle of the magazine? So you might not necessarily use the font that you're using for your masthead or your, your magazine title for the titles inside, right? I, right. I would almost say that you want those things to be separate. Like, I, ne I don't necessarily want to have to see this ever again, right? This is this thing. Yeah. And so once we move on, it's something else. Something new. Right? So that whatever those something else typefaces are is what I would use in the table of contents. Okay. So what, like the, what you're using for the titles of articles, that might appear both as the article title and, and the as the of table contents. of contents. That makes a lot so of sense. So that there's some me. kind of visual connection between the two things. Would you use numbers or bullets or the full chapter, chapter three, chapter four, or would it just completely be dependent on the overall look and yeah, feel? Yeah, it's dependent on like what the content is and what you're calling things. But whatever you do, you, it needs to be you know, consistent. It needs to make some kind of sense. If you call one thing chapter one and there's no chapter two, that's just sort of confusing and weird, right? Yeah, so, which is, that's the theme of all my publications, is confusing right, and weird. Right, it's all just chapter one. You said something a minute ago that I think is really important, which is, in essence, you were saying, well, maybe you've designed it in a way to make the reader slog through this entire thing. And mm -hmm. one of the things that we're all vying for today is attention, is to get somebody's undivided attention. 
And I literally, a couple of years ago, started to design things with the idea that I needed to make people slog or needed to confuse them or puzzle mm -hmm. them initially because it was enough to slow them down to get attention. Right. So have you done the same thing? Would you do the same thing? To, in, in essence, you're tricking people to get their undivided attention. Yeah. I mean, I do things like when I design books is I don't use page numbers consistently throughout. So for example, if you're in the plate section and you're looking at a series of images, I'll generally argue for no page numbers there. I don't want the distraction and it's, like, it's superfluous. But when you get to the essay, then there's page numbers on every page, right? Because now if someone wants to say, I read such and such on such and such page, there's your reference. So I think, yeah, it's all, it's all relative. It really depends on what you want to do. And I think when we were talking earlier, we were saying how important it is to have some kind of clear editorial vision yes. for what you're doing. Like, why am I doing this thing? How do you get a clear editorial vision? How does someone, if you've never made a magazine before and uh -huh. you're sitting out there watching this webinar and you're like, I'm, I'm making a magazine, uh -huh. how do you come to that? I know how I, and mm -hmm. I don't even know if I st have one at this point, but I think I do and I know how I got there, but it took me a long time. How mm -hmm. would you come up with that? I think it's like, what's really driving you to want to make something? What is fundamental to that? Is it like you and your buddies skateboarding? That's enough, all right? So you start there and it's like, okay, what is it about skateboarding? Is it like breaking into private property or is it yes. like going down the street? Is it doing the tricks? Is it the fun of making videos? What is it about that topic? What is every last little thing about that that drives me? And then you can go through there and decide, okay, within that, I could make a mag I could make 20 magazines on this. In one issue, it could be all about this thing, this thing, and this thing. In another issue, it could be about these three things. And then we could come back to that. And then as we get popular, suddenly this person isn't interested and we can collaborate with them. So it, so it can snowball from there. But I think it has to come from a very deep-rooted personal passion for the subject matter. And that's, you can't fake that. That's consistent with your book publishing as well, too, right? Mm -hmm. People are working on these things that they've literally poured their life into. Exactly. Yeah. And years and years of their lives. Years. Yeah. yeah. And this is an impossible question to answer, but if, if you do a skateboarding magazine, which I hope you do, what from beginning to end time frame, let's say that you already had the content, the, the photographs were done, uh -huh. the copies written. Yeah. How long would you spend putting something like this together? Because the reason I ask is, is I've run into a lot of people over the years being a, being a blurb person who have said, well, I have to work on something for X amount of time before it's legitimate. And I've always, I think about a book that I did in 2007 that took about 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's probably been the most successful book I've ever done at Blurb. And it sort of, that book in many ways turned everything I had learned about publications inside out. And I right. thought, okay, this doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. apply to me. Yeah. Is there any specific time frame that you would work on something like this? I mean, if I was just starting out and I yeah. had no idea what I was doing, I would say, you know, the, the key thing to remember about design is it's iterative. You do it, you look at it, you think about it, you make a decision about it, and you do it again until you feel like it's in a place where you're ready to let the world see it. And I think that ties back to what I was talking about earlier, which is print the thing out before yeah. you upload it. You know, so the um, how much time that takes, I don't know. The first one might take a really long time as you struggle through trying to figure out what you want to do, or it might take no time at all because you're just going for it. I don't think there's any hard and fast rules about any of this stuff. Do you show your work to others? Like for me, it's uh, you mean as I'm working. Yeah. Well, when I have clients, of well, course, they have to see it. Let's say, for example. Yeah. John is in Fort Lauderdale and he's building a magazine today based on this webinar and he's halfway through. A lot of people kind of are secretive about what they're doing and my response has always been get some people that you trust and uh -huh. get people from a wide variety of, of mm -hmm. directions and show your work because you're going right. to get feedback. That's yeah. crucial. Right. And basically what you're doing is they're saving you from yourself and you mm -hmm. being, you're high, very skilled, you've done this a long time. I was just curious as if there were sort of confidants that you had that you would say hey, this is a design decision that I'm making that I'm not 100% sure of. Would, do you do that or you just own everything? 
when I do things for myself, I want to force myself to have to decide everything on my own. I want to okay. totally struggle through all of that individually. Okay. Because in my practice, it's always highly collaborative. Okay. So when I make things for myself, I want the exact inverse of that. I want to just completely sweat it out. So it's actually a freedom for you to be able to work entirely on your own as opposed to yeah. the give and take of a client. Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of freedom, but it's also a different sort of discipline, right? Because when you're working with someone, I can just sort of throw something out there. Maybe I totally believe in it, maybe I don't. But if it's not right for them, they'll just say instantly, yeah. right? That's wrong, we need to go in a Give different you direction. direction. Whereas when it's me, I, I have to just look at it and decide out of the infinite number of things this could be, out of all the decisions I could make, which decision is the right one for this thing at this time right now. That's harder. Historically, this is, I'm transitioning here to the next question. Good transition. Historically, are you a magazine reader? And what are some of the magazines through history that you've said these people get it right? I read this magic, mm -hmm. this you know, religiously. The two samples that always jump into my mind are National Geographic and Rolling Stone, mm -hmm. and those are the two publications that I consistently see people collecting. Mm -hmm. You know, my brother read Rolling Stone, and my grandparents right. had had National Geographic. Yeah. What about for you? I've been reading Rolling Stone since the mid '70s. Wow. And have subscribed since the late '70s. And the golden era of Rolling Stone was when Fred Woodward was the art director. Okay. Un un he's at, uh, I better not get this wrong. <laughs> he's at GQ now. Fantastic. Certainly National Geo, my parents got that. Why was his reign at Rolling Stone, what did he do that made it special? Well, Rolling Stone had that great run when Roger Black was the art director. Then he left and they sort of went like they stumbled around in the wilderness for a while. And then they brought Fred Woodward in and he completely uh, uh, renewed the graphical feel of Rolling Stone. It's like he figured out what the Rolling Stone-ness of Rolling Stone was yeah. and he just ele 11. 11. And it was, it was fantastic. And what about now? I haven't seen it in, in a while, actually. It's okay. After he left, it was a, a mess for a while. It's okay now. It's now tiny. Uh, a lot of the graphical things that you associate with Rolling Stone are gone. Uh, but, you know, the writing is still good. And what can someone, a lot of the people who are Blurb users are also followers of National Geographic. What can a Blurb user learn from National Geographic magazine? A couple of things pop into my mind, but I'm not going to say anything because you are, after all, the expert. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, well, uh, you know, great photography wins every time. Yeah. And clear presentation of complex information wins every time. What about their cover? The cover, I think, you know, for a magazine like National Geographic that's like almost entirely subscription oriented, um, the cover is not quite as important as it, as it is for a newsstand magazine. So it's okay. like if I love Rolling, I, if I love National Geo, it's coming, and I'm going to look at it, and it almost doesn't matter. I think the thing for me about the Geographic that I love is that it, it is the yellow magazine that is instantly mm -hmm. you see yellow from a hundred yards away from a newsstand, and you know exactly what it is. And I think yeah. that that yellow is their brand, and mm -hmm. it is so entrenched in yeah. how many decades or I don't know how long they've right. been publishing the yellow border. The yellow border. It's just mm -hmm. that consistency. Uh, this is a magazine that is done out of Albuquerque. I just interviewed Justin a few weeks ago, actually, and called Gig Magazine, and he, he does this on the inside. He's got this nice, uh, for some reason, yeah. I absolutely love this. It's yeah. very significant to me that he's chosen a color like this uh, because I can flip through a stack of magazines and immediately go, oh, that's a Gig Magazine, that's a Gig Magazine. It's right. consistent. And it's consistent. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Uh, what else? So geographic, what we're going to do here is uh, talk a tiny bit more and then I'm going to go back through some of my slides and I also want to remind people who are watching the webinar that Blurb has a series of templates and I think that these templates, especially when it comes to magazines, are going to be really helpful to you. You can go to the Blurb website and download basic magazine templates that will import into BookRite and they will basically take you from zero to sixty. It's pretty remarkable. They include things like table of contents, really beautiful covers, uh, magazine spreads, etc. And for, I know for me personally, 
when I sat down and first decided I was going to design a magazine, the template was an amazing starting point. And the great thing is that even though it's a template that imports in, nothing is solidified. You can move, change, and, and alter anything that comes in. So basically what it is, it's a, it's a jumping off point to actually uh, to get your first magazine off the ground. Mm -hmm. Because for me, I would be personally, even after doing all these things, if I had to sit down and design a, what I would call a prototypical magazine, it would take me a while. Mm -hmm. You've right. seen me on the computer. It's not pretty. <laughs> I could barely do the photography thing after 25 years. So now I had a little request here to go back through some of the slides. So I am going to jet back here to the beginning of my pr lovely presentation, my lovely keynote presentation. And this is the Blurb webinar series. Obviously, we're at blurb.com, so all of the information or much of the information in regards to magazine is on the website, as well as the templates I just mentioned. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, at Smog Ranch. That's my handle on Twitter. Do you have, are you, you're not crazy enough to do Twitter, are you? I would just get myself in trouble. I, that I can vouch for. You can also find a lot of the interviews, especially things like this, where I just interviewed Justin from Gig Magazine. That's all on a website called shifter.media. That's relatively new. I launched it a couple, about a month and a half ago. Lots of interviews, lots of photographs, et cetera. And there's also a section on there called print, which features publications from a variety of different kinds of people around the world. Uh, why magazine? I'm just going to run through these real quick. These are magazines are great for installment publishing, collaborations. We talked a little bit earlier about magazines signifying that there is another issue on the way. I think that that's a really powerful thing to uh, incorporate into your workflow. They're cost effective, and there is a historical sign significance. I misspelled historical, but I'm owning it now. So there was no copy editor. It's my fault. There's a historical significance, and we just spoke about Rolling Stone and the National Geographic. I think those are two perfect examples. And magazines are consumed differently. And I think in a world that's moving as rapidly as we are today, when I ride the BART in the morning and I see people reading magazines, I think that's a perfect, perfect illustration of how they're used. And magazines have become a brand. We have refueled here. We've got print shift, gig, et cetera. So it's a, a great way to brand. Standard design elements, and I think Bob said this very, very well. You don't necessarily need any of these. You can design yourself into the ground, and I think sometimes it can be a little overly complex. But things like running heads, credits, uh, a kicker. Obviously, you need body copy if you're going to have some sort of written story here. Subheads, pull quotes. I'm a huge pull quote fan. The book I designed yesterday must have had 15 pull quotes. It kind of became a theme, and I mm -hmm. thought, I'm never showing this to him because he actually Just knows doing what he's all doing. Pull quote issue. All pull quotes. He's dangerous. So again, these are all terms and items that you can use or not use depending on what you're what you're trying to accomplish. And if I can move on here, Todd, typography, Bob's wheelhouse. So you've got to consider things like style. the style. The type style. <laughs> That's it. Well, look, you've got the Paisley shirt. That's right. Quantity of fonts. These are things that I put in here because I've seen a lot of books come through Blurb that have, let's say, too many fonts or the, mm -hmm. not, a font that doesn't relate to the actual content of the publication. Right. And how crazy is crazy? We talked it's about never crazy enough. Never crazy enough. Although using Rodeo for body copy, not exactly the best move. Right. But if Pat, anyone wants to line. look up the amazing book Cyclops by Albert Watson, which came out, I'm thinking in the mid, mid 90s. Mid 90s. Amazing book if you can find it. He's also an incredible photographer in general. He's one of the best, best ever. Uh, masthead and table of contents. And a masthead is uh, a title of a newspaper or magazine at the head or the front of the editorial page. This is like your, your handshake, mm -hmm. in essence, what this is. Right. Your logo, how important your logo is. I am in the process right now of trying to develop a logo for Shifter. I think mm -hmm. I have a concept in my head of what it's going to be. It's going to be brilliant, clearly. I mean, the masses want it. Uh, and you're, we talked a little bit about table of contents, typography, potentially matching and using that same font, not necessarily on the masthead or the title of your publication, but potentially the chapter heads or the subheads, just to keep things consistent. Style again. And is it mandatory? Do you have to do a table of contents? Absolutely not. I have still to this day never done one. I feel kind of proud that I've never done one. I think you should keep that. And as you just said, there are no rules. Mm -hmm. There are rules. Darius told me once that, yes, book publishing, book design, there's a lot of rules, but you can break any of these rules you want if you have a good justification. 
Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. You agree with that? Absolutely. Design consistencies. We talked about cover. If you're going to the National Geographic with the yellow border on the cover, they've had that since the inception. It's, I think it's a very powerful thing. Having said that, Ray Gun magazine, the designer of Ray Gun, went in the total opposite direction mm -hmm. and redesigned the cover every single time an issue came out. So I think that, that that to me just screams freedom and you should do what you feel like doing. Uh, Bob spoke a lot about consistencies in typography, and I think that that's really important. I think type is such a, a, an ocean of information um, and the places that you gave us to look for fonts I think is a good which was foundry did I get that right or wrong foundry type Vi village. village you work for them my fonts god I was where did I get foundry from I don't know that's I don't know that my dad had a foundry when I was a kid maybe that's, that's it. it it's coming back to haunt me page count the default page counts for magazines you, you know we're in the 20s is there any and I like small because it, it sort of lends itself to serial publishing. Is there any specific page count that you would say it has to be X amount? No, of course not. But Good. I would say the more pages, the better. Because the idea of a magazine is that it's holding a bunch of different things. So yeah. you need enough pages to get all those different things happening. OK. Good advice. Story length. Uh, one of the things that I love about doing my own magazine is as a documentary photographer for years, as the publishing industry changed and the editorial world got smaller and smaller and smaller, space rate went down and down and down. And suddenly these 10-page spreads of the late 80s, early 90s were down to a two-page spread with a single photo. Publishing my own magazine, this is the, the last sort of magazine that I put out and sold to the, to the public. That has almost 100 pages, and it's all my content, which is mm -hmm. a completely egotistical thing to do. But you know me. It fits. So I gave the brand. stories the space that they required to, to be run. And you can, right. you can do that when you're publishing your own, your own publication. Uh, the next thing here is this is the, the BookRite homepage. And you can see here that there is a magazine format right dead center in the middle. So that's where, where you find these things. And again, just a reminder, this is the, the template page on the site, which will get you uh, a good starting point if you're going to crank out a magazine. You can also use InDesign with our InDesign plugin to make a magazine if you choose to go that route. You're an InDesign user, oh, clearly. Yeah. Have you ever used BookRite, or you just go straight to InDesign? There was some tool you guys had. BookSmart. Book, yeah. BookSmart. And I would just make JPEGs, yeah. full page JPEGs, yep. and then import them into the full page thing so I could avoid all the templates. Yeah, you don't have to use the templates. You yeah. can always design. And BookWrite allows you now to do anything you want. You can right. design and save yeah, templates. It's a more sophisticated It is tool. more sophisticated. Yeah. Uh, just to very briefly, there's a couple of slides here. This is how I currently am using magazine a lot of the time, is I do documentary projects. And I take I design a magazine based on the content from the project. And then I take that into the field with me. And I'm able, when people say to me, who are you? What are you doing here? It's a lot easier for me to hand them this publication mm -hmm. than it is to try and explain these convoluted stories that I'm actually working on. So this is a, a publication that I've been working on for a while now. This story has been going on for four years, and I've probably made four or five different versions of this magazine that have progressively gotten larger and larger, mm -hmm. higher page count because I've created more content. And I cannot tell you how many doors this has opened because mm -hmm. the story is about the American West, but it's very confusing of exactly what I'm doing and why, and I can't explain it. If, if I'm two minutes with a Border Patrol officer and, and he says, what are you doing, and I try to explain it, they think I'm crazy. So I hand him a magazine and they can at least flip through it and say, get out of here, <laughs> which is typically what happens. And also, don't overlook the fact that when you make a physical magazine, you can also make a digital version. Uh, this is something that I've learned a lot about recently, and I actually really like this format. It's inexpensive and it opens up your publication truly to a global audience because anyone with an with you know, an internet connection can basically con uh, connect with your work if you choose to go that route. So my homework assignment for you mm. is experimenting more with, in the digital space. Because we can't just have Bob's knowledge in the print world. It's got to transcend to the digital world. <laughs> the masses are waiting. That is the grand scope of my presentation. But do we have any questions looping in from uh, from Lori. Bob, do you have any questions for me? It's been a while. We haven't had to uh, catch up really about anything. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Any magazine questions for me? The book that you did where you were at uh, LAX shooting at the end of the runway. Yeah. Such a beautiful book. Oh, thank you. That's the book that I was referring to. It's called On Approach. Uh -huh. And it was 2007. Mm -hmm. 
it was actually in Orange County that I shot that at John Wayne Airport, not LAX, oh, okay. because I'm lazy and I shot that whole book by riding my bicycle around. Uh -huh. Oddly enough, I would get stopped by the police almost every single time I went out there. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, that's and what brought that to mind was the highway patrol comment. Yeah, they would they would drive up behind me and sit in the car and like and I would turn around and wave with my you know Fuji six by nine camera and I'd wait for planes to come in. And they would say, uh, what are you doing? And, and I had that book with me. And I would say, look, I'm, this is the project that I'm working on. So with those guys, sometimes it worked really well. And other times, they refused to look at it. And, but they, once they found out it was a camera and not anything malicious, then I was OK. Right, but right. yes, I've had my uh, millions of run-ins with uh, the authorities over mm -hmm. the years. I think that's a natural part of being, being yeah. a photographer these days. It's probably going to happen more and more. It does to me all the time. Really? Yeah. When you're I, shooting? Yeah. All it takes is to have a professional looking camera and you're a target. Yeah. If you go around with your phone, yeah. it's no big deal. Okay, so we have, we, have, we have questions. So one person has a question. That's good. Yeah. We've done and our job well. it's not you or, or, or me. Lori, we've got, a, we yes. got a question here. What do we got? We actually have lots of questions for right. you guys. Uh, here we go. Justify the text blocks or not to justify the text blocks? That I got that one. All so uh, it depends on how narrow your columns are and how big the type is. So the narrower the column and the bigger the type, the more difficult it will be to justify. So you should be flush left at that point. If you have, I'd say, two, maybe three columns and the type is small-ish, then you can justify. But it's crucial that you have the hyphenation settings turned on. Otherwise, you'll get giant gaps between the words. It's right. funny you said that because I yesterday I got giant giant gaps. It's yeah. the giant gap thing, yeah. And it was like we're talking giant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are called rivers for those of you keeping score at home. It was alarming. They were so big. <laughs> it was like a flood. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. So, our viewers have heard that serif fonts are better for long articles. Is that still true? It's a good question. Are serif fonts better yeah. for long articles? It's true in that people read best what they read most, and so they're most familiar with serif fonts. And so it becomes like this circular thing where the question answers itself in that regard. But I would say, yes, generally speaking, serif better for long articles. Just look at the New Yorker. Yeah, right? good example. Yeah, long form journalism. Serif typeface. Is there anything better than long form journalism? No, but even the long form has gotten shorter. I, I know. I remember when New Yorker articles would just go on and on and on, and now I can I can finish them in one sitting. It's I know. like that seems wrong somehow. Yeah. Well, I yeah. think that you know we have to make a stand at some point. <laughs> we have to dig in. Next question. So, if you are doing a magazine using serif, should you stick only with serif? For the text. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Uh, so I, consistent I, throughout serif all the way through. Yeah, I would say if you want to switch to like some serif, some sans serif, there should be some kind of reasoning why. Like a certain kind of thing is one typeface and a certain kind of thing is another typeface. That's when I would be willing to switch it out. What about if you did an interview and you had the Person question asking, and answer. Yeah, question and answer. Interviews are a great little typographic adventure because there's so many different ways you can indicate those two things. Um, I love to play with that when I typeset interviews. So yeah, the question maybe in a sans, a little bold, then the answer in a serif. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah. All right. Question about designing the magazine. Do you make a storyboard first, or do you just dive in and go to blurb.com and design it? Mm, that's a good question. Storyboards are a good idea. Um, at the very least, you should make an outline of the content and have a sense of how long you want everything to be. It's like it's making editorial decisions. Like, sure. this story is important, therefore it's going to have a lot of space. This story is interesting, but there's not as much there, so it's shorter. So at the very least, you should do that kind of storyboarding. Whether or not you have to like sketch everything out ahead of time, 
Uh, I don't know. I don't work like that what, anymore. What I do is I start, most of my books are il illustrated, they're image based, and what I will do is I will make an edit of the photographs and then I will print everything. And typically it's small, they don't have to be fancy prints. And then I lay those prints out and I make my sequence, or what right. I think is going to be my sequence. Right. Then I go to the blurb software and I begin to lay things out. Initially when I made books, I always did the cover first. Mm -hmm. Now I have an idea for what the covers are going to be, but I'm not married to it. And I allow for changes within the book, and then sometimes I come back to the cover at the end. So that's how I start, start and finish. Great. We have one last question, and the questions seem to be about the same topic, which is long form, short form magazine, minimum page count, maximum page count. How do you decide you know, how thick your magazine is going to be, how many pages it will have? It's the content. It's the content. I think content drives. I, I get the yeah, reason the I asked you. Content drives the whole deal. Yeah. The reason I asked you that question earlier was I've had that question a million times: is how many pages do you need to, to do a book? And the book that you were referring to, the on approach book that I did, that has eleven photographs and twenty two pages. Mm -hmm. And again, it's been probably the most successful book I've done. And it kind of went in the face of everything that I was taught at photography school about what a book was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, well, all, all right. these rules that I had forced on me all those years ago, they don't really apply anymore. Yeah. So I kind of like thin magazines because I like to dole out little pieces of a story, but what you said earlier is also a good point. This is an 88-page magazine, and I think it's got a really nice right. heft, and there's mm -hmm. a lot of work in here. I think, yeah. so th there is no right and wrong, in my opinion, of how many page count. The content is what drives everything. Totally, yeah. I think that's probably the theme of our whole talk, is it's like you start with the content. Yeah. Right. What's your idea? What do you have? What do you want to say? What's your like? What's your thesis statement, sort of? And then how do you uh, run that out through the design and the pacing and all of those other design issues? I think sometimes we get the cart before the horse, and I think when you have when you start with a really phenomenal body of content, you hold all the keys, all the cards, mm -hmm. because you can do anything. It's when right. you don't have it that's it's tough. Yeah. Uh, so what we're going to do is we are going to email the viewers a recording of this webinar in 24 hours. So we've run out of time for, for questions. We're actually going to have to wrap up the webinar. But we're going to email the viewers a recording of this whole thing. Bob and I were live here. It's magical. We know that. But now there is a canned version that will be <laughs> on the way within 24 hours. So I appreciate you stopping by. My pleasure. Totally. And, uh, it's always fun to, to talk with you. Yeah. You are, uh, I could pick your brain all day long. So really appreciate you sharing the knowledge with, with us and, and everyone else. All right. Thanks and, for uh, asking will me. you promise to come back? I'll come back. Okay. Good. You got it. You this know. room is so awesome. Who wouldn't want to spend more time in here? I know. I love this room. So thank you very much. All and, right. Uh, everyone have a great day. See ya.